What's up, everyone? Thralls of Metal back again. I am Shredlord. Jim and John. I'm Krog, Nick. And we are super pumped to bring you another discography ranking. This time, it is the beloved, the long-awaited Judas Priest. Now, Judas Priest for me began as a boy, probably around 13 or 14, just getting into guitar. My Uncle Buck showed me a live concert DVD called Live in London, which was a live concert DVD with Tim Ripper Owens uh, at the time during the demolition era. And from that moment on, I was hooked because before then I probably had only heard You've Got Another Thing Coming and Breaking the Law on the radio. And while they were cool jams, they never really grabbed me by the cojones like like everything else Judas Priest. So that's kind of where my journey began and still love him to this day. I, believe it or not, was a late entry to Judas Priest. Um, of course, I've heard Breaking the Law and you got another thing coming because if you owned a radio at any time in the 80s, even to current, you uh, probably heard that song <laughs> or those songs for that matter. But yeah, outside of knowing a couple of those songs, I just was never really exposed to Judas Priest until much further down the line, pretty much when I met this guy. And he was like, hey, check this out. And even then, the, the vocals got me, and I was like, meh, whatever. And so some years went by, and actually up until the point we did this ranking, I wasn't fully versed on Judas Priest at all. In fact, going through some of these, I was able to go, hey, I know that song. All right, makes sense finally. But yeah, this is pretty much like a, a full new entry in my book. Uh, my uh, exposure to Judas Priest goes all the way back to the age of MTV, me sitting in front of the TV in my underoos, watching MTV, and yeah, uh, back then you would come across a uh, notably cheap but hilarious video for Breaking the Law. Uh, you would even see, an, uh, you got another thing coming. You would even see, uh, maybe, I think they did a video for Living After Midnight, too. What about Hot Rockin'? Uh, we tried to skip that one. <laughs> but we did see Turbo Lover. Uh, but yeah, like uh, that was my exposure to the band, and they were like probably one of the first bands that I would say was like legit heavy metal. Like they were like the band I thought of. They had like the leather, they looked fucking tough. You know, I was like, yeah, this is this is what heavy metal is, right? And uh, yeah, I've been a fan ever since. I kind of you know thrived on my uh, metal collection they had that giant three disc one, the Metal Works, and then actually within like the last. You know, five years or so, I really started like getting all the albums, and uh, yeah, I love this band. Yeah, without a doubt, they are a band that even if you don't get into them, you've got to give them their respect and due diligence for the fact that they are not only a good band uh, for Gateway to get into, you know, heavier metal, they're just classic heavy metal. You Absolutely. know, if, if someone just wants to hear a good example of just some classic kick-ass heavy metal, um, Judas Priest, man, you know, to me it was kind of like the holy trinity of metal, Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, and Judas Priest. That's, that's where it all, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So let's get down to business, shall we? First of all, let's give you a little history on Judas Priest. Now, as much as I've tried to cling to my brain cells, I only have a limited supply left, so Please allow me to read off this sheet as there's quite a lot that takes place in Judas Priest before the band actually even really begins. So, I digress. Formed in 1969 by original vocalist Al Atkins and bassist Brian Bruno Stapenhill with guitarist John Perry and John Frieza Partridge on drums. After an unfortunate suicide by John Perry, the guitar player, they tried many replacements, including a young Kenneth K.K. Downing, but at that time decided to pass for former Earth, or Black Sabbath as you would know them, member Ernest Chataway. The name Judas Priest was taken from a Bob Dylan song called The Ballad of Frankie Lee and Judas Priest by Stapenhill. He thought it was a really cool name when he heard the title and stole it for the band. This formation of early Judas Priest recorded a two song demo that gave them a three album deal with Immediate Records. But they went out of business. <laughs> you immediately. Know, they, yeah, immediately. <laughs> so, you know, they went out of business before they could actually record anything. So the band fell apart. However, later in the 70s, Atkins found a band called Freight without a singer that consisted of K.K. Downing, Ian Hill, and drummer John Ellis. From March of 71 until 72, the band joined Iomi Management. Yes, that is correct. Mr. Tony Iomi 
Of course, uh, Black Sabbath and Earth were already moving, and he had a little bit management company to try to help some of his fellow British musicians, and I didn't even know that until we dove into this. I thought that was a cool thing, so yeah. So then vocalist Al Atkins leaves, and Ian Hill, the bass player, his girlfriend has a brother who is a singer, a little guy by the name of Rob Helford. I don't know if you've ever um, heard of him. Seems familiar. Yes. We will talk much more about that lad later on. He was in infomercials. Yes. Yes. I, a I lot remember. of infomercials. Yep. Yep. Um, for a lot of leather and um, biker, bald biker accessories. Coach whips. With new vocalist Rob Helford, they also got drummer John Hinch and ended up signing a deal with Gull Records. Now, Gull Records liked the band the way they were. However, they felt like they could add a second guitarist to really fill out the sound. And they were able to find an incredible guitar player who ends up being one of the main heart and soul members of the band, Mr. Glenn Tipton, guitarist extraordinaire. Now that we've gone through everybody, we now have Judas Priest as it really began. So the first record they ever put out, in September of 1974, they released their first real full album, Rockarola. It was produced by Roger Bain, who produced the first three Black Sabbath records. And it is the only album to feature John Hinch on the drums. This album was also recorded in a live setting. Um, so what that means is there's no takes, there's no, everybody is in a room separated by walls but recording everything live at the same time as if it were a live concert versus everyone going in one by one and recording their tracks. So being a, that's I think that's kind of adventurous. However, that's how the big boys did it back then. They all did like Led Zeppelin, Rush, a lot of those bands, you know, uh, if you're familiar with Rush, there's an amazing song called La Via Strangato. I can't pronounce it right now. <laughs> La Via Strangato. That's Strangato. the one. Yeah. yeah. They recorded that live, all of them live. And if you know that song, that is a stupid feat to accomplish, but once again, back in the day, musicians, you that's all you did is you played music because that was your living, you toured doing that, so you were so well practiced back then that that's how you would do it. I don't know, I like live recordings. We've done yeah. it a couple times. I, I dig the vibe. It's good and bad. To me, this was more of a blues bass. This is kind of like a little more rock and roll blues. This album was knocked a little bit by the critics because of some production issues. There's like a buzz that goes throughout the whole album. And initially it kind of flopped uh, commercially. It only sold a couple thousand albums. This was my number 17. Once again, while this is a Judas Priest album, they have not found their identity yet. They're they're wearing the hippie flowery clothes. They're, you know, their hair's feathered and everything's um, glitzy and glammy. Billowing and shirts. It's just, it's it's not Priest yet. It's it's on the path, but we're, we've only taken one step. I had this at number 12, and honestly, out of all these albums, this was the only one I had not listened to, just because, for me, Priest starts with the next album. But uh, I actually, you know, jammed it, and I didn't think it was terrible. It's it's more of like, again, like a blues rock album. Like, it's just, it's not Priest yet. You know, there are some, you know, underlying metallic moments, but it's more like a Black Sabbath sort of vibe. Uh, the title track, I think, is kind of interesting because it's almost like a disco track. Like, you could, <laughs> you could shake your ass to it. You could. And you shouldn't, but you could. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's up to you, you know, whatever. It's got some fun grooves. I actually like One for the Road. Uh, Cheater is a little bit more metallic sounding overall. It sounds like them pretty much just uh, playing to, you know, the, the heavier scene that was around the time. So there's stuff that's very comparable to, again, to like Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Scorpions, uh, even Aerosmith at times. Um, it's it's an all right album. It's just you know it, it's just kind of weird. And then I was kind of weirded up with the song Caviar and Meths. I I don't quite get this like like fancy tweaker shit. I don't Probably. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know the English they have different slang. But uh, overall I don't think it's a bad album. It's just you know I, I wouldn't put this on if I wanted to jam Judas Priest. Like, sure. It's it's just kind of oddly chill and uh, oddly not Judas Priesty. I had it at number nine. Well not. Judas Priestie, I still really like the vibe. I like the kind of bluesy rock, chill, relax, uh, just kind of jammy vibe. The song Winter actually reminds me of something like Primus would cover, or Pink Floyd, or um, Hendrix. I don't know, I just think it has a nice jammy vibe, and I can see why it's obviously touted as not a Judas Priest record, and I can also see why it's touted as maybe not one of their greatest works of all time. Um, of course, you know, the drummer they had, 
I, I see why he didn't last long, and I see why they wanted to go in a different direction, but I kind of dug it. Uh, he was like a extra basic Bill Ward. Mm-hmm. And, and Bill Ward's not basic, so yeah, maybe not like Bill Ward. I don't know. It, it's it's just a very different album. Like, there's even like some spacey kind of like stoner guitars on there too. And, and I like, like that stuff, but yep. that's not not my Judas what Priest. what I look for in Judas Priest. No. Moving on. Now we're starting to pick it up. So a couple of years later, uh, on March 26, 1976, once again released through Gull Records, and the only album to feature now Alan Moore on drums is Sad Wings of Destiny. This was my number 12 album. This album is very important for the history of heavy metal. While it was not commercially a success still, much like Rockarola, it did sell better, but this made a lot of fans in the area. This album started to bring them a following. Uh, it was more heavier, a la Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath. This had the grit and some of the themes that they would start diving into as far as lyrics go and, and more that heavier sound. It wasn't as heavy as they're going to get, but you hear they're starting to really craft the sound now, and they've left all the hippie flowery bullshit with the patchouli candles at the campsite. Pretty sure they were still wearing kimonos at this point, but it didn't sound like they were wearing kimonos at this point. I had this record at number eight, an obvious progression from the first record. They did get a little bit more heavy. There were finally some decent leads, like they didn't get a chance to do really in rock and roll up. It was catchy. There were more um, obvious thrash nods than there were rock and roll. Victim of Changes right off the bat. That's got a, such a dirty, riffy opener. Still to this um, day when they play it, man, it's the intro itself is, is fucking sweet. Yep. Uh, Genocide is a fucking jammer of a song. Catchy, lots of galloping riffs. I like the, the natural progression you could already see going on. And I, I really, I, I like the early stuff. Witchy Jammin' John, don't you know you're driving me and... I had this all the way up at number three. I love this album. This is where the heavy metal really starts coming out. You have the very iconic album cover. The logo looks a little bit more sinister, but the sound, the sound, you're getting the tropes of heavy metal, you know, the harmonies, the fucking heavier riffs. There's more dark and sinister themes on here. They sound fucking serious on here. Do the Ripper and Genocide, you start getting more of those heavy metal gallops on there. Mm -hmm. Victim of Changes is like still up there with one of my favorite songs of them. But Island of Domination, I think is like a great deep cut on here. And uh, Dreamer Deceiver, excellent fucking song. This is just, I don't know, like it's such a huge jump in terms of the first album. Like they really just kind of like latched on to finding an identity here. And they wanted to be this badass metal band with, you know, some cooler, you know, uh, balladry on there. But, you know, the ballads even sound kind of dark and sinister on here. But, yeah, this is a stone cold fucking classic. Like, this is one of those albums where I would say, like, this is why heavy metal sounds like heavy metal. It's yeah. shit like this. Now, breaking onto the scene, it was time for a follow up to this excellent album. And you didn't have to wait that long. Back then, a lot of bands, once again, Albums came out quick, you know? You're on the road, and when you're off the stage waiting for the other guys you're touring with to finish, you're writing new songs for the next album, so when you're off tour, you're back in the studio. 1977, released through CBS Records, with a real budget this time of 50,000 quid, thank you CBS, <laughs> 1977's Sin After Sin, also produced by Roger Glover of Deep Purple. I believe originally they brought him in, they kicked him out, they're like, no, we want to do this on our own, and then some shit went down, they couldn't figure it out, so they brought him back in real quick to finish it because they didn't have a lot of money and time left. Sorry, that's our bad. You're fired. Just kidding. They also fired drummer Alan Moore and brought in famous world-renowned session drummer Simon Phillips, who is fantastic. Nick and I were just talking, and Nick said, you know, I'm surprised they didn't keep him a little longer because yeah. he, yeah. he is a hell of a drummer. This reached number 23 on the UK charts, and it is the first of 11 consecutive gold records for Judas Priest, right here. Sin After Sin, this was my number 11. So this continues on the heavy metal freight train that is becoming Judas Priest, even features a cover of a Joan Baez song called Diamonds and Rust. This song would go on to be a staple in their concerts and live performances, the way they do this track. They basically made it their own, and I think more people are surprised that Diamonds and Rust is a cover 
when they hear that news. Joan Baez actually loved the cover. <laughs> yeah, too. yeah, she was ranting and raving about it. I had it at number seven. Uh, I love this album. It definitely has, again, like another step towards like darker, more sinister material. In fact, the first song I ever heard off of this album was not actually originally done by uh, Judas Priest. It was originally done by Slayer, their cover of Distant Aggressor. I was like, that's mm. kind of a cool song. Sounds a lot different than the other songs <laughs> on this album. And then I found out, oh, it's a Judas Priest cover. And then I listened to the original. I was like, dude, this song yeah. fucking rips. Yep. It's legit like one of their heaviest to date. But uh, Let Us Pray, Call for the Priest, is fucking awesome. The opening track, Sinner, is such a dick kicker, like right away. Mm-hmm. This is like a little bit slightly more refined, though I had to bump it down because... For the life of me, I still cannot get into The Last Rose of Summer. Uh, it, it, it's too AM radio air supply. <laughs> like, it, it, it does not fit. It sticks out like a sore thumb on here. And that's even in comparison to their other ballads. And it also kind of comes like too soon on the album. Like it's what, the third track or fourth track? The fourth track. Yeah. That, that's too soon. Like, keep that towards like the back end because I mean, when it gets down to like the heavier songs, like Raw Deal, good sleazy rock riffs and some very homoerotic uh, lyrics in there. That, that's something that definitely shows up a lot more in the later albums. But yeah, like the ballad, I don't know, that one, like I don't mind their ballads, but that one just kind of sticks out to me. But bumped it down a little bit. But yeah, this album's classic. Uh, it's it's kind of a going trend here, as you see. I like a lot of classic Priest. <laughs> With that in mind, I had it at number five. It's darker now. There's tons more song dynamic. The leads are really starting to stand out. Like, you know, I started marking leads through ranking all of this, and I realized that I just pretty much marked every song as far as good leads were concerned. But yeah, songs like Starbreaker yeah. with that catchy dark riff in the beginning and all of Dissonant Aggressor. Yeah, Raw Deal, albeit questionable lyrics. Well, yeah. well, I mean, there's a good reason for there's that. There's a good reason. There's a good reason. It was Halford's coming I mean, out song. So. I could make a whole video with you guys about I'm, song titles. And, I know. Yep, and I, maybe one day I will. <laughs> we'll start with Ram It Down. Uh, <laughs> God, we could start even earlier than that in, in this discography, because uh, we already have. But, uh, you know, the, the thing that I really like about this album, too, is it's very proto new album. Like, yep. I hear a lot of stuff on this album that would definitely you know, get over to bands like Iron Maiden, Saxon, Angel Witch, you know, all those bands. And uh, yeah, no, it's fantastic. So like we were saying, you don't have to wait too long for albums. So pretty much right away after releasing this, they get going, get grinding again. And in February of 78, released by Columbia Records, and the first of three albums to feature, once again, new drummer Les Binks. We have 1978's Stained Class. You also don't have to wait long for new drummers with this band. <laughs> no, it, it almost makes me think that Spinal Tap meant to poke fun at them <laughs> when they talked about all their drummers, just because, wow, they've been through so many. But I digress. <laughs> this album is my number six. I love Stained Class. This is almost like a precursor to thrash and speed metal with songs like Exciter, Invader. This is just like... Once again, if we take Rockarola out of the equation, this is kind of like the th- the third album, and they're really starting to fire mm-hmm. on a lot of cylinders mm-hmm. as far as their songwriting goes. You're really starting to see the lead playing of Glenn Tipton and K.K. Downing being something that's really cool and really formidable and really something to talk about. And without going in too much of a tangent, one thing I always loved about K.K. is... To me, Glenn Tipton has always been the superior guitar player. KK is an amazing writer, and he does do some awesome leads. But what's cool about KK is, as the Priest years have gone on, he's gotten better and better and better. And if you start listening and paying attention to the KK solos now, in this era here in the 70s, and then we start doing like Angel, like his solo in um, Judas Rising off Angel of Retribution... I mean, some people might not even think it's the same player. It is. He's just gotten better with age like a fine wine. So, sorry. My number six <laughs> album, it is what all my thrash heroes talked about. This is one of the albums that all the thrash bands I listened to growing up would talk about because it's fucking chock full of energy and balls, and we love balls. John, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> 
I had it at number seven. By this time, even listening to all these albums, by this time, like, I'm, I'm really getting in to Judas Priest by the time I've, I've hit this far. First of all, Les Binks, I thought, did a great fucking job for his first record. Um, the drum lines were getting catchier and starting to, you know, follow things like syncopation and, and mood changes and whatnot. Exciter, right off the rip, is a killer song. And then I thought this record gets notably more darker after Invader. All that shit in the back half is gold, as far as I'm concerned. The song Savage, with the epic vocal opening, into that big galloping riff. Hero's End, the breakdown, if you will, in there, gets downright fucking heavy. Yeah, at this point, I'm having a real good time. Yeah, the guitar work is getting better, it's getting more fun for me. This kind of really opened my eyes and made me a Judas Priest fan. <laughs> This is my number one. I fucking love this album. I don't think there's a single weak moment on it. Some of the most iconic riffs. You get a lot more of the dual leads now. Every member contributed to the writing on this one, too. And every member fucking shines. Like, Rob Halford sounds incredible on this. Dude, Savage, Saints in Hell. The chorus on the title track is just fucking amazing. And Exciter... I would say is like definitely like a proto thrash metal speed metal mm -hmm. song that you know drum intro is fucking iconic i love that weird crawling riff there's a lot of stuff that i think at the time in 1978 i don't think anyone was really hearing that judas priest was no. doing here and hence why this is such an influential album this is also the start of the iconic judas priest logo we moved away from the old english and now we got this kind of razor sharp one again kind of even contributing more to the metal imagery uh, yeah, every song in here is just fucking incredible. And, dude, ugh, Beyond the Realms of Death. Yeah. Man, that that is, I would say, like, almost their first true blue, like, kind of epic song. Like, it's yeah. epic, dark, yeah. it's almost a ballad, but it's got that big, heavy chorus. Yeah. Like, dude, this is just great fucking songwriting. And let's not forget, one of the greatest guitar solos Glenn Tipton ever plays is Beyond the Realms of Death. It's beautiful. It's set up. If you, if you know the song, it's basically about a kid who passes away, kind of locked in his own depression or disability, and, you know, and then he passes away, and here comes Glenn with the big epic solo, and it's just fucking beautiful, man. Glenn's the man. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, the, this album, like, I mean, honestly, I could say, like, my top five, and maybe even top six could all be, like, number ones here, but this one has always stood out to me as just... Like, fantastic song running across the board, mm -hmm. and again, it's just, it's flat out iconic. So yeah, that's uh, my number one already. Everything's downhill from now. <laughs> <laughs> now, four albums in, they start to establish themselves as a heavy metal band. And only nine months later, they're already back with another album. Now, this album, released in November of 78, had two titles. In the UK, it was released as Killing Machine. But here in the States, they released it after one of the tracks, Hellbat for Leather, as we all know. Now, this album was cool. This was my number eight album. I like this album, but this album interjected a little bit of accessibility, I mm -hmm. think, into their songwriting formula. I think that's one thing that Judas Priest always wanted to do from the beginning. Even though they wanted to be heavy metal, they always wanted it to be accessible to people. So there's going to be times and songs throughout this discography where I think sometimes it's too accessible. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of where it all started. Songs like Hellbet for Leather, of course. Um, another great cover here, The Green Man Alishi with the two-pronged crown. Love that cover. Both of those songs are still staples in their set list to this day. This is a killer album. Like I said, these songs are great. Once again, another killer, amazing solo on Hellbet for Leather by Glenn Tipton. Now I think the guitar world is finally starting to see that Glenn Tipton deserves to be up there and talked about with the big boys and the duo of Tipton and Downing is starting to be viewed as a very respectable guitar tandem just like you know your your Dave uh, and Adrian so to speak. So yeah, this is a great album, a little bit more accessibility than Stained Class, but still everything's heavy um, and still keeping the lyrics dark and the themes of the songs dark. I had this at number 13. Still a good record. I, I think it was weird. Like I found it to be more open to having riffs and less of lead melodies. I don't know, I got kind of used to uh, a lot of lead melodies and a lot of just fun guitar work going on. And while this still had it, 
I thought personally it had a little bit less. A lot of decent grooves and a lot of decent riffs. The lyrics are kind of dumb, I thought, on this record too. <laughs> Not that this will be the last time I mention dumb lyrics by any means. No. But uh, I like the guitar tone more. I guess on this record, like mixing wise, it started to get a little bit better. I don't know. It just fell to 13 for me. I have this at number nine and I see this as definitely a transitional album for them. Uh, this is where like kind of that 80s sound is starting to creep in. Like the guitars are a little bit more chunky sounding. You're kind of losing a little bit of like the more Sabbathy warmth that was still there in like a lot of the earlier material. And the songs are definitely more like streamlined. They're, you know, kind of like First chorus, first chorus, you know, maybe a bridge in there. There's not a lot of the, I wouldn't call it like progressive songwriting, but like more dynamic songwriting. Like these are kind of straight to the point. And sometimes they're really good, like Delivering the Goods, Running Wild, Hellbent for Leather, killer tracks. And then you have some more ballady tracks. Uh, Evening Star, it's, 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 it's okay. Well, um, not really. You're my evening star. <laughs> no, dude, that chorus is so bland. Like, dude, it doesn't even sound like you're very into it. Maybe he wasn't. <clears throat> Maybe he wasn't. I don't know. Uh, but Before the Dawn is actually pretty good. But, I mean, the big one that really just flat out annoyed me. Uh, take on the world, dude. It, it's mm -hmm. it's a cheesy, we can do it, you know, queen. Uh, just, yeah, we will rock you knockoff. And I, I don't like it. It's just. I didn't either. It's just a, it's just a bad song. Outside of that tribal drum groove that opens it up, the rest of it's kind of. Yeah. And. Well, I mean, in terms of lyrics, like you definitely get again a little bit more of the the subtext that Rob was putting in there on uh, burning up in evil fantasies, but I mean they started going for like the heavy metal tropes, mm -hmm. like you know, like just stand up and yeah, we're tough, and you know, I, I kind of miss the storytelling aspect that was in a lot of the earlier stuff, but I mean overall, I think it's a pretty decent album. It's just you know kind of growing pains, I guess. You get leather studs now, you know, you got to fit the part. Well, at least Rob did. He kind of had the. <laughs> the thing on and the rest of the band was just like, I don't know if we're ready for that yet. It's like, don't worry, next album you'll be ready. <laughs> so believe it or not, Judas Priest actually took uh, maybe almost two years uh, in between albums this time, but I think they did it for good reason. Uh, the next album on this discography, released on April 11th, 1980 by Columbia Records, British Steel. This is my number five album. This is the first album to feature Dave Holland on drums due to a money issue. So they recorded a live album called Unleashed in the East and there was some kind of financial dispute with the drummer and the management and rather than settling it by giving him more money, they basically just kicked his ass right on out of the band and got Dave Holland. Overall, critically and fan opinion this album is basically a masterpiece uh to a lot of people and this album is really what helped kick judas priest kind of from the uk to being more of a household name in the united states this album was very popular i remember hearing many an interview with guys like dimebag daryl and stuff talking about how much they love this album for pantera fans you want to know the whole reason dimebag has the razor blade necklace pendant is because of British Steel by Judas Priest. So this album was very influential to a lot of later on musicians, just like a lot of this early Judas Priest was, man. This was, this in 1980, this was some heavy groundbreaking shit. And classics like Living After Midnight and Metal Gods, um, while they may be overplayed by now to some, no. they are still classics. I have this at number eight overall. Uh, I really enjoy this album. I mean, honestly, like legit, probably my first exposure to Judas Priest was this album, you know. Again, the music video for Breaking the Law, which was done for like $20 uh, <laughs> back then in 1980. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just like staple cheese, but it's the melodies, it's the hooks. They kind of took that more refined formula they were going for in Hellbent and they made it stick. Like the guitars have this great sound, like they're rich, they're crispy, there's a good crunch to them. And they were kind of, again, sick with that simplified formula, but they were writing like anthems with giant hooks, like Living After Midnight, it's not overplayed. Anyone can put that on at any time and I'll be like, yes, that song, yes, that's awesome. Yes. Same thing with Rapid Fire, Steeler, like those are almost like proto thrash metal songs right there, like, they, like a little bit more of that machine gun guitar action. Metal Gods is a flat out anthem, I've had that chorus stuck in my head for months now because, you know, going through all this Judas Priest. 
It's just an instantly catchy song, except for one song, United, which is like <laughs> Take on the World 2, United Boogaloo. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not good. But even outside of United trying to ruin this album, it doesn't completely ruin it for me. I, I love like most of these songs. And this one definitely, again, kind of pushes that more metallic sound overall. Like It's definitely starting to sound like the stuff that would influence a whole generation mm -hmm. of metalheads up here. Like this is like a landmark album for them. They got some crossover success across the pond finally. And uh, yeah, no, this, this album's fucking legendary. I had it at number six. Once again, by this time, I'm really getting into this band. And this has two songs that I knew on it that I didn't know I knew were on it. Breaking the Law and Living After Midnight. I got all excited because I was like, I know these songs. Because again, you know, Lady yeah. and Drink at the Party. It's more thrashy. The lead work still, I'm, I'm head over heels for all the lead work. You know, being a, a drummer myself and at least a musician, being around uh, good talent. Uh... <laughs> You know, you get more into guitar leads, and, and it's getting better. Dude, Rapid Fire is a banger. Of course, Breaking the Law, because I know it. <laughs> Dude, The Rage. I think that's an excellent Rage is a good song. song. Um, Steeler, Whoops Ass. Mm -hmm. And and United, albeit... Uh, United, we stand, one and all. Yep. United, nope. albeit, <laughs> while it may be heavy for this time period, at least. God, what a fucking... No. I sit down <laughs> for that song. He sits down to pee for that song. Yep. Yep. That's that's pee. the kind of energy it has. Yep. A sit down. A pee. sit down pee. Yep. Yeah. Not not the greatest of songs, but yeah. Overall, um, it definitely didn't ruin the record for me. It's number yeah. six for me. So now that we've gotten back up after our pees, uh, <laughs> we were, united we peed though. United we pee, one and all. <laughs> the seventh studio album, man. We're getting to seven. That's crazy. So. The seventh studio album to come from this band after British Steel was recorded and released on February 27th, 1981. That is Point of Entry. Now, Point of Entry is my number 14 album. There is one song that I always loved off of this album, and I guess I thought I liked this album a little bit more than I did until I went back and re-listened to it. Now, the song Desert Plains is one of my favorite Judas Priest songs. Learned how to play it when I was a kid. Loved the track. But... Then you have songs like uh, Hot Rockin' and Don't Go and All The Way, those songs that are more, once again, kind of more on the accessible side than they are on the on the rockin' side, even though Hot Rockin' is rockin'. Uh, like lukewarm rockin'. Yeah, it was lukewarm rockin'. This definitely had a much more radio-friendly format uh, in, in the songwriting, but still, it is not a terrible album, and there are some nuggets of goodness upon here. Number 14. I had this at number 12. For me personally, I just thought it was kind of a more meh album. The songs I thought seemed kind of watered down from the get-go. While I'm digging the, the mix more, and it does seem a little bit more put together, eh. You know, songs may not be all that. There are some catchy moments. Um, I did dig, of course, Don't Go, uh, Solar Angels, Turning Circles. Like, I, I thought there were still some good jams on this album. And it, it's catchy at times, it's, you know, rocking at times, but to me, I just thought it was kind of meh. Yeah, uh, I had it at 14 as well. Man, Heading Out to the Highway is one of my favorite Juice Priest songs. I absolutely love it. It's like a perfect fucking driving song. And I bought this album based on that song. And, well, what I got was a really uneven mixed bag. Like, Desert Plains, Solar Angels, good songs. But then the rest of it is just really just watered down. And I, I get that I think there was a lot of label interference with this one. Like, hey, you guys struck it big with a couple of big singles. And, you know, they were huge. They had, like, you know, MTV music videos and shit. They became, you know, much bigger kind of overnight. So they wanted to capitalize on that momentum. And uh, they put out this rather tepid kind of watered down version of themselves that while it's not their worst, it's definitely not their best. I mean, hell, even the album covers they had, both of them weren't that great for this. Like, the one we usually see with the paper going off in the distance, like, yeah. it sounds like you put as much effort in the album covers as you did some of these songs. Like, dude, like, Troubleshooter? Man, that song, they sound bored. They sound yeah. bored, like, uh, just uh, just write the riff. I don't care. <laughs> We're out of coke. This sucks. Yeah, Hot Rockin' sounds like it has potential, and then the chorus comes in and just kind of wrecks it. Like, And if you've ever seen the music video, it's amazing. <laughs> you say yes, just bad. It's just bad. Like, I... I I don't get it. Like it's very major chord driven, and I get they were trying to 
go for that brass ring and see if lightning struck twice. It didn't. Um, granted, there are some good songs here, and the, these songs will keep me coming back. Like, even On the Run, I think, is okay. But most of this is just, I don't know, sort of an experiment, I think. And uh, not it did not one. yield great results. So the next two albums for me, I'll just go ahead and say it, are incredible greatness. I hold the next two albums in very high regard. So following Point of Entry, in 1982, released in July of 82 by Columbia Records, we have Screaming for Vengeance. Screaming for Vengeance is my number three Judas Priest album. This is one of the most kick-ass classic heavy metal records, period, in, in the book. It starts off with the electric eye, with the hellion, and it just doesn't stop whooping a horse's ass with a belt, as Wesley Willis would say, uh, <laughs> from front to back. And even though they had already had some commercial success and had broken through in America, this album actually really pushed them through because they took the heaviness of British Steel and amped up more of that and mm -hmm. took back some of the some of the cornball that was there. And this album actually peaked at number 11 on the UK chart. So they're pretty much almost in the top 10 here. Um, very commercially successful as well. Tracks like Bloodstone, oh. um, Riding on yep. the Wind, Screaming for Vengeance itself. I mean, those are songs that to this day, your little earworms will get stuck in my head or I'll be at work and I'll just start saying a line from it because I'm weird and that's how I work. So yeah, this is a <laughs> killer album this is number three for me i absolutely love this album and the album art cover is oh, disgusting i mm. love it i have this at number two this is one of my favorite judas priest albums actually one of my favorite just classic heavy metal albums dude like almost every song in here is not only just like riffy excellence like you know appeals to the metal heads but man they're fucking catchy mm -hmm. like all these choruses are fucking huge dude bloodstone i fucking sing that shit in the car like all the time that groove hits, that riff, dude, it's just awesome. I don't even care if he's just repeating the same word over and over again. It's awesome. The songs are flat out anthemic. I even like uh, Take These Chains. Dude, that is an amazing power ballad. Like, I don't know, it, it just oozes 80s excellence. Dude, the chorus. It is, a lot it's of, amazing. I've made a lot of parodies to that song, which I'll share with you when the camera's not on. I am <laughs> most you certain. Move you move away. Have. Don't do me no good. 3,000 miles don't help like I thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hell of a restraining order. <laughs> no, but yeah, like this is, uh, again, one of those albums I, I, I just go to when I just want pure 80s metal. It has all the hallmarks of it. The production's great. Rob Halford sounds so goddamn good on here. Look, this is one of my favorite vocal performances from him. Uh, yeah, this is a stone cold fucking classic. Uh, I want to say at my local record store, they have one of those mirrors with the logo on it yeah. and it's screaming for vengeance. And I'm reasonably sure like mountains of cocaine was snorted off of it. And that's about as eighties as it gets right there. Yeah. I had this at number two. First of all, I know a lot of this record. I didn't know I knew a lot of this album until I actually got into listening it, and I was like, oh, that, that's a Judas Priest song. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Dude, all these songs are killer. The Hellion, I've heard that song so many times, but didn't know I heard it as a Judas Priest song. I'm just like, oh, this is a good jam. Electric Eye. Like, seriously, in my notes, a ton of times I wrote, oh, no shit. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, songs like Electric Eye, you can see how influential that is to today's music. Now, I've seen so many bands pull from that camp, not knowing that's where they pulled it from. Dude, Mastodon, oh, yeah. totally pulled from that song. Yeah, Screaming for Vengeance, You Got Another Thing Coming. Of course, I've known that song forever. Um, coming for ya. Yep, Devil's Child is a jammer. Um, Prisoner of Your Eyes, I'm even being a ballad, like I'll eyes. even give him props on this ballad. Like it's it's a good song. The ballads are good. And You've Got Another Thing Coming was actually like an extra. Like they had had this album like yeah. kind of completed yeah. and and they were like, well, we got like room for like one more single. And they were like, well, I got this riff we were kind of toying with. And it was like, yeah, it's just kind of, see, we can just turn into like a simple rocker. And yeah, it ended up being one of their biggest singles ever. And yet another song I'm not going to turn off if it comes on because it's awesome. And the record went double platinum. I mean, come on. Come yeah. On. Come on, folks. What's there more to say? Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. You own it. You should. Yep. Now... Another short break in between albums this time, almost two years, following the great success of Screaming for Vengeance. In 1984, on January 13th, released through Columbia Records again, they released Defenders of the Faith. 
This is my number two Judas Priest album. This album is huge to me for a couple reasons. The song The Sentinel is one of my favorite Judas Priest songs of all time. I think the opening riff to The Sentinel is one of the coolest fucking heavy metal riffs of all time. Songs like Eat Me Alive ended up on the Filthy 15, which was, if you are young, Al Gore, believe it or not, before he was inventing the internet, uh, his wife and him thought that they could run around and tell everybody's kids what they could and could not listen to came up with a list of 15 filthy songs and tried to basically slam all of these guys with the PMRC, blah, blah, blah. Believe it or not, in glorious fashion. Yeah. Believe it or not, they were being super serial. Yeah, they were very serial. But believe it or not, a long-haired Brooklyn, New York man by the name of D. Snyder verbally bitch-smacked every single one of them, um, along with other people in the testimony, but really it was D. Snyder that elegantly and intelligently just basically told them all to fuck off and how dumb they were because, you know, we don't need no, 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 no parental guidance here. God damn it. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. But anyway, I digress. I love this album. You have tracks like Some Heads Are Gonna Roll, um, Eat Me Alive, The Sentinel, for, and the album cover is disgustingly oh, sweet, by the way. Tracks like Rock Hard, Ride Free. I've actually been lucky enough back in the day to see them play weird cuts like that live uh, with Rob Helford in, in concert. Just every song on this album gives me that warm, goosebumpy, nostalgic feeling, and I fucking adore this album. So, number two for me. I have this record at number 10. I don't know what's wrong with me. Somewhere in my rankings, I lost track of numbers. No, this album is great. Obviously, songs like The Sentinel, Rock Hard, Ride Free, Some Heads Are Gonna Roll. There's a bunch of great songs on here, but I found myself really liking this album for the leads and not so much for the songs, if that okay. makes any sense. And so, while there's a bunch of great songs on here and they're obviously catchy and riffy and, you know, it's Judas Priest, we're having a good time, I thought the record was really bassy and the guitars I thought could have used a little bit more crunch, so it kind of fell a little bit in the mix. And again, while the songs were good, I just found myself really latching onto the leads. And, and while that's great because they're obviously killer leads, I didn't latch onto the songs as much. So, number 10, we're, that's where we're at. I had this at number five, uh, another one that I hold in high esteem. I feel like it's like the heavier sequel to Screaming for Vengeance. And this one, I guess you could argue, it's more about metal hooks versus like the poppier, like, you know, big sing-along choruses. Granted, it still has like big choruses, but this one feels way more metallic. Like the guitars, again, kind of step up a little bit. They sound crunchier, but there's way more aggression across the board. Like some heads are gonna roll. Dude, Eat Me Alive is such a banger of a track. Free Will Burning Jawbreaker. And I even say like Love Bites with the droning bass. Like it's kind of like a moody, dark piece. You know, my, my issue with it just being like a little bit lower because it is like super close to Screaming for Vengeance. My issue is it, it feels like they're kind of striking while the iron was hot again. But you know, instead of like trying to make a more accessible one, they made a heavier version. And it's still good. Like, you still have all the Judas Priest chops on it. Mm -hmm. It just, I don't know, it follows such a standout album, too. But again, it's number five out of 18 on here. So, you know, I'm not, not really slamming this at all. Like, it's a top five album. So, yeah, this album's killer anyway. Yet, some more time goes by after conquering. Basically, by this time... Judas Priest is one of the biggest metal bands in the world, period. They are riding an incredible high right now, a lot of successful albums. And two years past Defenders of the Faith, they decide to keep the ball rolling. And on March 21st of 1986, once again through Columbia Records, Judas Priest releases the album Turbo. Now, Turbo is my number 10 album. I have a little more love for this album than my other cohorts. Quite frankly, just because sometimes I gravitate towards weird shit. It's who I am. And there's some songs on here that I absolutely adore, such as Out in the Cold and Turbo Lover. However, this is the first Judas Priest album to feature synths. And this has a very glam metal vibe to it, for sure. It was actually originally meant to be a double disc, but they scrapped the idea 
and decided to just kind of release Turbo as a one disc album. Theme on this, love and romance. This is very much a glam metal love and romance album. Something that I read doing some research for this is during this time, Rob Helford suffered from a lot of substance abuse. I think if you watch Judas Priest in concert, you can tell that there were some substances riddling his vocals. There was a period there where he just didn't seem too on and I think that was kind of, you know, drugs. He was also suffering from some domestic violence with a relationship that he was having and when his partner decided to unalive himself that was the motivation that he needed to try and uh, get himself clean just because sometimes when you're really upset and depressed and on drugs it's a it's a long hard road out of hell yeah, that, to that, quote Marilyn Manson. That cocktail is not, no. not where you want to be. Yeah while it is very glammy I still think this album has some fun songs even like a locked in which is it, it's kind of a corny it is a corny song i'm not going to say kind of but <laughs> once again it's kind of a fun song and i'm not going to lie to you this has a super sweet arpeggio section with glenn tipton just shredding balls i absolutely love it and there's this little weird animatronic skeleton in the video that i always thought was funny as hell so whatever man i like it it's good to me now you can listen to these guys shit all over it. I had this at number 11. Glam metal is not for me. Understandable. I'm just going to throw that out there. Understandable. Um, th there were a couple of decent songs nonetheless. Locked in. Rock you all around the world I think is just kind of... I think it's fun. <laughs> out in the cold. Darker, colder song. Even Hot for Love. Dude, ripping Ooh. fucking melodies. Yep. Ripping fucking lead and melodies. And it's weird how... When the music switches to a more spacey kind of vibe, the lyrics detract from it. Like they were always touted for having kind of cosmic sci-fi lyrics and now you've got this record finally that's a little bit more cosmic and spacey and now the lyrics are all love. I have mixed feelings, but I'm not a huge fan of this album. I'm not a huge fan of this album at all. This is number 16 for me. This was the big glam metal gamble. Uh, I partially blame, you know, label interference. I also partially blame poor choice making here uh there are two songs in here that i like and it's the title track and out in the cold like th those two are really good songs they're well written they're catchy they actually sound like judas priest and the rest of this sounds like a combination of like cinderella and poison and jackal in drag uh and it's it's just bad like <laughs> it really is like it, it sounds it sounds like like every other glam metal band. And they had a sound that stood out and now they are just kind of uh, softening up everything, even their image. Like if you look at what they were wearing during this time, like man, that, that hard leather image just kind of got all swirly and you know, uh, very interestingly patterned and they all look like they got attacked by like several cans of Aquanet. Well, yeah, I was gonna say Rob Helford had some very uh, greasy slicked back hair mm -hmm. then. Yeah, it was yeah. about... I bet you if you let it down, it'd be about shoulder length, but it was all greased, like, mafia style. It was kind of odd. I mean, again, you know, you're going through depression and sadness yeah. and, you Your know, looks going to be edgier. And, and, right, right. Yeah. Your looks are just naturally going to be a little bit edgier if you're going but, through but all that. there's nothing edgy about the music. Like, no. it, it, no. it is a flat-out pop album, like, parental guidance, which you so <laughs> brought up. God, why? That it song is... is it's, it's corn fest. It's so bad. Yeah. Like, And they reference You Got Another Thing Coming in there. Like, I was offended that they referenced a better Judas Priest song in one of their <laughs> worst songs. Like, it, it's it's so damn bad. But it's not the worst, because there's still two albums below this. But this this album, like, I, I get. They, they kind of gambled. They want to have some fun, even though they were kind of in a dark place. Like, I guess when they went on tour for this, like, Rob had already sobered up, and he... Everyone said, like, dude, he sounds like the best he's sounded in years. So that was awesome. Like, the one good thing that came out of this was that Rob straightened out his life, and he's, I believe, stayed sober ever since. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, he still has Metal God status as far as I'm concerned, but oh. I choose to of forget course. that this one happened. Rob Halford is easily one of the greatest vocalists of all oh, time. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm never going to argue world. that. He yeah. still sounds good. Yep. Insane. So after doing the commercial thing of Turbo, and like we briefly talked about how Turbo was supposed to be a double disc album. So let me explain that a little bit further. So when Turbo was originally released, they wanted to do it as a double disc and have the first half be the more glam kind of metal songs and the second half be the heavier. Instead of doing that, they decided to take two years between albums and basically release that second half 
as 1988's Ram It Down. Now, Ram It Down is my number 16. It's almost uninspired to me. There's really nothing new or nothing creative or anything. It, to me, it's just kind of there. It's not the worst thing I've ever heard. It's still Judas Priest riffs to a degree. Um, it's still some great leads, but things like the cover of Johnny Be Good um, and <laughs> the fact that most of it is a drum machine. So this would be Dave Holland's yeah. last uh, album. He didn't even really do most of the album yeah. it was mostly a drum machine and i think it was very easy to tell that i think this album was basically just like glenn tipton just trying to really go for it as much as he can i've heard in interviews rob helford defend this album and think that if you listen to it you know it is glenn tipton playing his ass off and while i agree the songwriting was was just not there for me and neither was the sound yeah, I had it at number 15. To me, it often doesn't sound like a Judas Priest album. Like, just at, at times, you're like, I don't know if this is it. Like, the, the cover of Johnny B. Good, legit, the only reason that I would ever like that ever is because it reminds me of Back to the Future, and I fucking love those movies. That's it. The mix overall, I guess, was a little bit better. The fact that it was pretty much a drum machine, even though it wasn't, even though it was, like, it, it, it did sound uninspired. It just sounded like they were like, all right, here's your other half, fucking whatever. You know, there, there are some decent songs at times, Come and Get It has a darker riff to it and a really shreddy lead, but then again, all the, the leads, man, fucking spanning almost their entire career, uh, except some places that we'll get to. Monsters of Rock, I actually thought I was like a pretty solid song. Kind of doomy, had an awesome melody to it. Um, the, the lyrics are cheese, but what do you want? It's the 80s. But, I mean, really, let's be honest here. Yeah. The 80s was full of fucking cheese, and why should Judas Priest be immune to it? They haven't been immune to it before. Might as well have it be cheese again. It wasn't bad, but it, to me, I just thought it was all just kind of cheese. Riffs, leads, all of it. Even the, the structure of songs sometimes was just a little cheese, and it wasn't my favorite. Yeah, I had it at 13. Uh, it's cheese, and it's cheese that's been in the back of the refrigerator for an undisclosed amount of time. Um, the, the the drum sound just annoys me. Like, yep. It's that big 80s can drum, and, you know, it isn't as though, like, Dave Holland was the most creative drummer out there. Like, he was just, he kept a rhythm. So, you know, replacing with the drum machine... Yeah, not not really like that big of a difference. It's just the sound of them. But the songs kind of just feel stock. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, repeating some tropes, like, uh, you know, like a less inspired string for vengeance. Uh, I, I do like the title track. The title track's awesome. And it's got that great heavy metal bridge on it. Hard as iron's not bad. Uh, Love Zone's okay. A lot of these songs, I don't know, there's, there's just not much to them like yeah they're heavy they got the big 80s lavish production but like honestly this overall kind of just sounds like the heaviest Def Leppard album that they didn't make <laughs> like dude I'm a rocker that's straight cheese <laughs> yes that's that's government cheese and for this being like the heavier side of the twin turbo thing yeah it's it's not that much heavier like there's still a lot of like poppier tracks on this one that you know kind of fit with the whole turbo vibe albeit with like more prominent guitars um yeah, it's it's not the best album, but it's got a couple of standouts. I occasionally come back to it, but uh, yeah, number 13. So, after Ram It Down, of course, after um, this album here, another two years go by. At first, it was pretty quick. Now we're getting to a standard kind of two years between albums. We get to what would be, number one, the first album with new drummer Scott Travis, who had recently played with a band called Racer X. Racer if, X is fucking amazing. With Mr. Paul Gilbert, of course, if you're familiar with Paul Gilbert. And this would also be the last album with Rob Halford for quite some time. This album, of course, released on September 14, 1990, is Judas Priest Painkiller. This is my number one Judas Priest album. This is basically the epitome of Judas Priest for me. It, it touched on all bases. It's heavier than shit mm -hmm. it has the classic judas priest sound the solos the leads are amazing rob helford's vocals are incredible and it's melodic all the way through but it never really gets too cheesy nope it keeps balls throughout the whole thing and i just think this album is a masterpiece also a weird fact those subliminal messages trials there's a song on an older Judas Priest album called Stained Glass. Yep, called Better Than You, Better By Me. And two friends made a suicide pact because of that song. 
and the parents actually sued Judas Priest, but because of that trial, they actually had to push back the release of the album a little bit, and I believe this is the first Judas Priest album to get a Grammy nomination as well. So this album is incredible, and new drummer Scott Travis just slays. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Weird thing about that trail, it, it was a cover song too. The, the band they covered was Spooky Tooth. Why didn't they go after the original version? Like, oh no, it's a metal band. They made it evil. I have this at number four. Uh, this is an absolutely awesome album. Their heaviest album to date at this point. The guitars are so much more rich and man, like it's, it's almost kind of thrash metal at times. Mm -hmm. Lots of galloping fucking riffs. The lead work is exquisite. Rob is pushing that higher register a lot. Like Dude, I mean, Painkiller, like, he maintains that shit throughout the entire fucking song. Scott Travis is, like, the best drummer to date. I mean, he's still in the band, so he's, yeah, in my opinion, he's the best drummer that's been in uh, Judas Priest. Instantly gives them more, like, tenacity, because his drum patterns are way more aggressive mm -hmm. sounding. And, yeah, dude, like, all these songs fucking whoop ass. Like, dude, Touch of Evil, that's the closest thing to a ballad on here, and it's not a ballad. It's a nice, sinister... Kind of moody, almost kind of sexy song. Yeah, it sounds evilish in those fucking organs and yep. Oh, What's dude. crazy is it's actually playing right now in the background and you guys can't barely hear it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yabbering. Uh, yeah, Metal yeah. meltdown, dude. Uh, between the hammer and the anvil. I mean, great song, dude. Like, there's so many good fucking riffs in here. And this was another one that could have been my number one, and it's just tough with the ones that I absolutely love here. But, Jesus, dude, uh, this album's an absolute monster. Way to fucking jump right in in the 90s with, like, one of their best albums, only to have the rest of the 90s be kind of questionable. This is my number one. This whole record slays. There's not a bad song on this album. It's heavy, it's dark, the leads are awesome, the riffs are awesome, the vocals are fucking awesome. All Guns Blazing, dude, the riffs in that song... Oh my god, Metal Meltdown, Between the Hammer and the Anvil, really all of them. Like, from start to finish, this record is killer, and I loved every second of it. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say. So after the success of Painkiller, you know, when you're in a band with somebody for, God, at this point now, we are going on, you know, almost 20 years, right? Naturally, tensions can flare and grow over time, so due to growing tensions along the way, and also Rob's desire to go in a different direction. He leaves Judas Priest in May of 1992. During this time, Rob would go on to do a lot of crazy stuff. Um, he would do a side project called Two, I believe with John Five of Marilyn Manson and Motley Crue now. He also did a band called Fight, which had a Toledo native, um, JJ. Yep, who the guy that did this tattoo. Excellent right. tattoo artist. JJ was actually the bass player in Fight along with a guy who nobody probably knows anymore named Russ Parrish, although his you would know him as Satchel from Steel Panther. He was actually one of the guitar players in Fight as well. They put out two killer albums. Yep. And also Helfer did his own solo albums, which uh, I think are incredible. The first two, Resurrection and Crucible, are really good. Judas Priest, classic, thrashy, kind of heavy metal vibes. As for Judas Priest, they would mainly lay low for a while. I think the rest of the camp kind of could use a break. You know, it's a big deal when you're world famous frontman decides to leave. So they take some time off, but they eventually regroup. They find Akron, Ohio native Tim Ripper Owens, who is singing in a Judas Priest tribute band. The movie Rockstar with Mark Wahlberg was basically based on this. Loosely. Loosely. Un until the band saw the movie and like, oh, fuck no. Yeah, no, this isn't how it went down. <laughs> but it was loosely based on that. Basically, they found him singing in a tribute concert. He had crazy range like Rob Halford, he could hit those high notes, and they decided to bring him in and start the short Tim Ripper Owen years for Judas Priest. And in 1997, on October 28th, Judas Priest releases their album, Jugulator. Now, this is my number nine album. I like this album, once again, a little bit, and by a little bit, I guess I mean a lot of it, more than these guys. This was the era that I first got really dove into Judas Priest, was kind of around this time, and I liked it. There's one of my favorite Judas Priest songs ever. There's a song at the very end of this called Cathedral Spires, which is kind of this epic masterpiece. Uh, this album was very heavy. They wanted, I think, to continue on. By now, there was a lot of way more extreme metal, death metal, um, black metal. All this metal had been exposed to the world, 
and I think Judas Priest wanted to continue and still be looked at as some of the old guard of heavy metal. A lot of, I believe Glenn Tipton used a lot of like Digitech solid state uh, gear through his Marshalls and his Hamers for this kind of sound. It, at times it almost has an overproduced guitar sound. It almost seems like a, maybe a little sizzly. That's kind of the solid state vibe, That's kind of a 90 will. sound too. Yeah, uh, a little bit of a 90 sound. However, this is, I believe, the first album with downtuned guitars as yep. well, yeah. They never really did an album with downtuned guitars. There's some uh, tracks on here that are tuned all the way down to C sharp. Almost kind of like robotic, cyborg, mechanical, biomech kind of themes in this album. And this is an album that was very divided uh, by the fan base, very divided. You had your devout Rob Halford purists, and then you had your Judas Priest lovers who loved Judas Priest, were sad Rob was gone, but they still wanted Judas Priest to create new music. And it kind of created this rift um, between fans. And so this album was kind of, I think a miss in a lot of people's eyes. And even to this day, I'm not sure if it's jealousy on Rob Halford's part. It kind of sounds like a little bit to me, but they have not played a single song from this era, maybe ever with Rob Halford. I don't know. It could be a matter of taste. Uh, <laughs> I have this at number 15 and it is odd because this was the first full length I ever bought by Judas Priest because I had the Metal Works compilation forever. I mean, that covers so much. But right around the time I was getting into them, they were coming out with a new album. They got this new guy. I'm like, all right, his name's Ripper. He's bound to be a, a badass. And I mean, he, uh, he's an all right vocalist. I still complain that he uses way too many effects in his voice. Like there's constant phasing and weird like machine-like effects. And this is definitely a product of its time. Like this is a band trying nice. to match up with the yep. current state there's a lot of like groove metal you know some more almost like death metal thrash metal gallops especially in like the title track um there are some good songs here like i like bloodstained cathedral spires is probably the big standout like it's a legit awesome song uh dead meat burn hell but i also have some issues with it uh while i like uh travis's drums uh, I think he puts on a hell of a drum performance in here. I don't necessarily like the sound of them. Mm -mm. And uh, the solos have just changed into like just a lot of Slayer solos, like lots of dive bombs or squealy. They've kind of lost a lot of that cool melodic edge. And again, I know it's like the 90s and they were trying to go for like a heavier, gnarlier approach overall. But uh, man, all right. Ripper is not a good lyricist. No. And they really show like, oh God, dude. <laughs> Death Row, Death Row is like some really dumb Megadeth B-side yeah. with just really bad lyrics. And this thing is a long album too. Like it's 58 minutes long and I feel like it could have been trimmed down a little bit. It's okay. not like the worst, but I, again, like, I don't know. I, I, I have, I'm kind of in that camp where I'm like, I, I love Judas Priest, but Ripper, I don't know. Like, I don't know if he was ever really a good fit. Like, yeah, he could do the Halford Wales and such, but like, there's a lot of stuff where he sounds like he's trying to sound like Rob Halford imitating Lane Staley. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's odd. So it fell to 15. For me, it's even lower. For me, it's 16. All right, first of all, maybe tweak the, uh, the metal zone a little bit, the Digitech metal zone pedal. Maybe just tweak it. Boss uh, makes the metal zone, but it's okay. I'm sorry, uh, is it? It's all right, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, whatever, the Boss metal zone, I don't know. I knew a bunch of people that used it back in that time period as well, and I would have tweaked theirs as well. Dude, fuck these lyrics. And the vocals, <laughs> really. <laughs> I don't get it. The lyrics are dumber than shit, dude. Abductors, I thought was a good song. Uh, Cathedral Spires, of course, is a great song. The drums sound unnatural. The vocals, I think, are terrible. I suppose it all makes sense given the time period. 1997, again, you have a lot of, like, like new metal is starting. Groove metal is certainly a thing. You got Pantera, you got Machine Head, and th this kind of falls all in that same vein. Like, a couple of the riffs are cool, but I think just the overall vibe of this record just was kind of for me. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's kind of similar to, like, the other messed ups, like Point of Entry and Turbo, where they really wanted to try for a different demographic. They were trying to appeal to, like, a heavier crowd that's been listening, again, like Pantera, Machine Head, and stuff like that, and maybe a little bit of new Metal. But, yeah, it, it it's just it's just not them. It feels forced. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So after releasing Jugulator in 97, about 
four years go by to the summer of 2001 where we will release Demolition. This is the final album with Tim Ripper Owens. It is the one and only Judas Priest album with a parental advisory sticker on it. Ooh. They said the F word. Oh my, oh my goodness. goodness. That's, wow. I don't know if I can handle that. This album, Glenn Tipton pretty much wrote everything. This album might have been, could have been used as a Glenn Tipton solo album. He did release one solo album called Baptism of Fire way yeah. back in the day. This album almost could have been been that. The album's all over the map. This is my number 15. There's one song on here that I really like called Hell is Home. I remember when I first heard that and I thought that was a great song. Aside from that, there's, there's not too many other great songs on here that really stand out to me. <laughs> um, and it just feels disjointed. Um, a lot of these songs are just kind of all over the place. So while I enjoyed songs like Hell is Home, you still have other songs like um, Nothing Comes Close, which is this weird kind of a ballad. It just feels kind of disjointed all over the place. Like there's no rhyme or reason. It's just a collection of random songs put on this album. Yeah, like super, well, again, like kind of like Jugulator, except in, in worse fashion. Worse, yep. Uh, yeah, uh, I have this dead last. I don't like this album at all. In fact, the last <laughs> time I listened to this was in 2001, and I didn't like it then, and I like it even less now. <laughs> uh, yeah, Judas Priest, and, well, I'm going to say it. This is their new metal album, and Judas Priest and new metal go together about as well as wearing a fucking leather vest with no shirt and a pair of Jinkos. Like, it's mm -hmm. really just cringy sounding, like, all the songs kind of follow like a big groove metal trope. The guitars even more down tuned. They kind of just stick to like a very basic groove. They're all just kind of watered down. And if you thought Ripper used too many effects in his vocals oh, before, Jesus. yeah, like he's busy trying to sound like some you know low rent cyborg from a '90s direct to video movie. It's it's so. It's so bad. Cyberface sounds like Fear Factory if they recorded a song while they were all suffering from a concussion. Uh, dude, Metal Messiah, there's there's some rapped lyrics in there. Like, yeah, kind of yeah, rap. Dude, no. 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 Like, everything that I don't want in a Judas Priest album is there. Mm -hmm. Is here. And this is like one where I would say, like, if this is your favorite Judas Priest album, you can just go ahead and say you don't like Judas Priest. It's way easier, and I'll probably <laughs> respect you more. Again, the clean vocals, uh, the the Alice in Chains. Uh, it, it's I, I don't get what they, they were trying to like target like every like well '90s trope in 2001, and yeah, this is just like the worst. Like legit, <laughs> like this is this is almost up there with like Aluminum Anus and uh, like. God, uh, catharsis. Yep. And I would even throw in supercharger there. Yeah, like this is just bad. And I'm really happy to not have to listen to it again. So you like it? No. How about you? This is also dead last for me. This is not a Judas Priest album. It's dog shit. It, it's the, all these, first of all, there's what, one, two, three, four ballads. All the effects. Why? 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 I mean, if you if you get a guy that you think is close to Rob Halford and can sing and can hit hit the high notes and whatever, whatever you were thinking, if you got him, why all the effects? I mean, I referenced Corn on here once. I referenced the Burning Red from Machine Head. It sounds like a culmination of all the bands that were trying during this era and like all the worst parts of all those bands. Third tier new metal. Yeah, it seems watered down. Yeah, just none of the songs make sense. Dude, Cyberface, no. Subterfuge, no. <laughs> Devil Digger. Um, um, I mean, feed on me. What the fuck? I don't like it. I got high while I listened to this record because I thought maybe it would help. And it didn't. It just made it a bad buzz. And uh, yeah, that did save it. And I really don't think anything will. And I am happy also to never have to listen to this ever again. So, after Tim Ripper Owens was in the band for some years and released these two albums, fences were starting to mend. Both sides of this camp were starting to talk and lo and behold, it was announced that the original lineup would be reuniting again. And this was glorious news for us fans because you know, it's exciting when the classic lineup of your favorite band, almost like when Dave Mustaine 
almost got Marty Friedman and the rest of the Rest in Peace lineup. Super close. Super close. <laughs> anyway, that's for another time. And in 2005, on February 23rd, the year I graduated high school, baby, wow. 2005, the return of Rob Halford and the release of Angel of Retribution. This is my number four album. This album was really important to me. I remember being a senior in high school and going with my dad to, I believe it was Target on Alexis Road to pick up this album. I was geeked for it, and I was not disappointed. The first track on here is a track called Judas Rising, and right from the moment that song kicks in, I thought it was fucking fantastic. This album was produced by Roy Z, who is a very well-known um, producer and guitar player. He's produced a lot of Bruce Dickinson's solo albums, uh, and has played guitar with Adrian Smith in Bruce Dickinson's solo band a lot. He also has his own uh, musical projects as well but he added a more modern production flair to them while they wrote almost a throwback this almost feels like a classic throwback judas priest album at times and i just love it i think it's fantastic uh this is my number four i have this at number 11 i got this the day it came out i had uh, seen judas priest for the first time and so far only time at ozfest 2004 with rob halford he even came out on the harley like dude i was fucking stoked it was awesome and when uh, this was announced i was giddier in hell and i really like this album it is definitely a comeback uh from a very 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 dark period but it, it's a bit uneven for me while i love judas rising deal with the devil demonizer like these songs capture the judas priest i had been wanting throughout most of the 90s there but it's a little uneven like uh, revolution eh, it's kind of a so-so track uh, worth fighting for. It's it's kind of a a ballady track, and it's I, all, yeah. It, I wouldn't call it a ballad. I guess well, it's more of like a. It's it it's has more of a like a somber yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of I, jammy. Like the bass is funky. It is. I don't know. Rob Halford sounds a little bit too much like Brian Adams on the verses. I know. I know. And I I hated admitting <laughs> that, but I mean he kills it on the rest oh of this. God. And Loch Ness. Uh, what a big doomy, nasty mm -hmm, closer. Mm -hmm. yes. But yeah, I, I had some issues with, like, it was just kind of uneven. Like there were songs that 100% captured everything I wanted. And then there were some songs that definitely felt like filler on here. But overall, I think it's a pretty solid album. And like Loch Ness is like a low key, like kind of sleeper track on there. So yeah, if you're willing to sit down for like a big, what, like 10 minute fucking yeah. monster fucking doomy jam from Judas Priest, jam that song. It's Badass. Here comes the revolution. Time for retribution. <laughs> oh, the rhyme scheme. If you think it's over, better think again. Sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't like that song. I had this at number 14. I mean, it definitely sounds like Priest again. I kind of fall in line with Nick on this, where it's it's okay, because there are some really killer songs, and then there are some just flat-out songs that I didn't enjoy. I did, like, Deal With The Devil, Great song. Hell Rider, and definitely Loch Ness. Loch Ness is a killer song. I would, I would come back to this album just to listen to that song over and over again on repeat. They're definitely, again, finding their groove, and they're kind of sliding back into the territory of being a, a, a good band that releases great records. Stella's getting her groove back. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's not my favorite. It, but it's definitely better than where we've come from with the two records prior. It sounds a little bit more, you know, inspired and like, okay, sorry about all that bullshit. Here's something cool. Riffs. Yep. And that's where we're at. So number 14 for me, still not a bad record though. I, I dug it. So after the release of Angel of Retribution, we get about three years that go by. Judas Priest decides to do a concept album. So in 2008, Judas Priest releases their next album, Nostradamus. This is a concept album about the ancient historical figure Nostradamus, and this was also a double disc. This would also be the very last album with K.K. Downing as the other guitar player, as he would later go on to retire in April of 2011 and leave us with another guitar player going on into the future. But before we talk about that, let's continue with Nostradamus. This is my number 18 album. I despise this album. <laughs> this album is basically a Rob Halford solo opera that they put some guitars on. I think this is a gigantic symphonic pile of shit. I was at Hocking Hills campground with my buddies and 
we were in the middle of fucking nowhere. We were so stoked for this album to come out because we had only heard the track Nostradamus and we thought it was cool. Little did we know it was probably the only track on that album that sounded like that because the rest was once again the Rob Halford fucking opera show. So we drive an hour to the nearest Best Buy. All three of us buy this album. By the time 30 minutes halfway to our trip back, my buddy Vince throws his copy out the window. We are so upset. I could not have been <laughs> any more disappointed in a Judas Priest album. If you guys thought Turbo was bad, to me, this is like Turbo times 1,000, 18. I could go on, but that's all I'm going to say. I had this at 17. This album is Hot Poop Sauce. Stop fucking with the goddamn formula. Coming off of the last record that had potential, and then, and then you get to this, and it's two record. Why two records? Why? By the time you hit like five tracks in, you've already sung four ballads. Stop it. I'm Nostradamus. No, I don't want to be Nostradamus. Do you believe? He was um, wrong about a ton of shit, too. The, Fuck Nostradamus. Yep, yep, <laughs> The album doesn't flow well. Lots of ballads, lots of somber intros. Revelations was kind of cool, but that that's about it. it Nostradamus it, was kind of like the old school John Edwards. Yeah, yeah, dude, just targeted guessing. Like, at least fucking saps will believe me. I'm wearing a weird hat. Dude, the, the song Death reminded me of um, in Billy Madison when he has his first grade party. <laughs> Billy and, uh, just passed, passed, the, Billy first just passed grade. the first grade. Oh, what a glorious day. Yeah. Uh, that was actually done by the band called Exiled, if you didn't know. But, yeah, no. I, I just, I, I didn't enjoy this either. Like, I I thought Jugulator was bad, but then I get to Nostradamus, and this is just a, a flying pile of shit. Another record that I'm thankful I don't have to listen to ever again. Yeah, no, I'm at 17 on this one, too. Uh, they should have just called this How Not to Follow a Comeback. <laughs> this is an hour and 45 minutes worth of music that I never want to listen to again. Nope. Uh, two discs. My God, I found uh, maybe two tracks in here that I actually liked. Death, actually, I kind of like that one. It's a little bit doomy and persecution. And then I wrote down some other ones for whatever reason, but they really weren't that good anyway. This whole album is like a new age religion meditational CD with riffs uh, and not like the best ones. Like it's just dull. There are seven transitional tracks on here mm -hmm. with like spoken word nonsense and chimes and synths that sounded dated years ago. I, I, I don't get it. Like this was just like a passion project, I guess. Like I want to do a two disc album about Nostradamus. Like, well, tons of metalheads have already talked about it. I was like, yeah, but they weren't called Judas Priest. So, you know, we're doing it. The first disc is just kind of bland rockers and then the second disc is mostly power ballads like there was there was nothing really left over on the second disc of outside of death which i think that's on the second disc i don't know i don't care Billy i don't plan on listening to it again the first grade i i just i don't get it this was just an overproduced uh nightmare of an album and for being as overproduced as is it doesn't even sound that good um, yeah, uh, I don't think they play a lot of songs from this album live, and with good reason. Uh, this was pretty divisive with uh, fans, and... Um, We've already spent way too much time talking yeah, no. about this Well, album. it's an hour and 45 <laughs> minutes long, there's a lot of suck on it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, number 17, not as bad as Demolition, but that's like saying one turd smells better than the other. So, almost a decade passes. After Nostradamus, I think Priest just ended up kind of touring and doing select off things. Uh, K.K. Downing would retire in 2011. And then Judas Priest would decide to add a new guitar player. They found a guy named Richie Faulkner, who is a phenomenal guitar player from England, who actually played in the solo band of Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. His daughter, Lauren Harris, had a solo band, and he was their guitarist, and ended up getting the gig with Judas Priest. And I think it was the shot in the arm that Judas Priest needed. Eight years later, after Nostradamus, on July 8th of 2014, Redeemer of Souls. This would be my number 13 album. The first one with Richie. This album goes back to that more Angel of Retribution kind of vibe and leaves Nostradamus way in the past as it should be. And I think the fans gravitated way more to this than Nostradamus. This was a return to classic heavy metal, riffs, dual leads, and solos. And I think, once again, the shredding because Richie Faulkner is a is technically much better of a guitar player than Glenn and KK from a technical standpoint and also he's half their age so I think 
with the new gunslinger in the band who has nothing but piss and vinegar to give, it really gave this album a lot of energy. I had this at number 10. Uh, this was definitely much better than Nostradamus. I, I really enjoyed this album. It's got a, a way more raw feel. Like the production sounds gritty, almost kind of dirty. But man, it's it's about the riffs in here. And dude, sort of Damocles. That became like a new favorite of mine, like in terms of this era. Like I can come back to that one quite often. Dude, Halls of Valhalla, Cold Blooded's really good. Dude, Secrets of the Dead. It's like kind of haunting and dark and epic. Like this has like just a good classic sense about it. I think the songs are Again, like a little bit more straight and to the point. Like, let's just get to the riffs, let's get to the harmonies, let's get to the big vocal hooks, let's do what we do. And in terms of ballads, I have to say, beginning of the end, one of the most honest and heartfelt ones I think they wrote. And it's about like a band being in their twilight, and that is Judas yeah. Priest at this point. I really like this. You know, it's just a well-rounded album. Like, it's got some so-so tracks on it. Like, you know, March of the Damned is yeah, kind of like a basic single. But for the most part, these songs sound quite a bit more inspired overall, and it's it's back to Judas Priest. And for that reason, I had it at number four. Especially getting this far through this ranking, it kind of spoke out to me a little bit more as what this band again was trying to do. First of all, it sounds much better than the last like five or six albums, really, as far as inspiration is concerned. The riffs are definitely getting a lot heavier. Like uh, Secrets of the Dead is quite possibly the heaviest, one of the heaviest grooves I think this band has, like period. Sort of Damon Cleese, really the entire like back half of the record I thought was super, super strong. The mix, while it is slightly more modernized, still carries that classic heavy metal feel to it. And I just really dug this record. And last but certainly not least, four years after the release of Redeemer of Souls, we get another Judas Priest album, which would be their last release as of right now. And that was back in 2018, and that would be the Judas Priest album, Firepower. Firepower is my number seven. I think this is a much improved version of Redeemer of Souls. While I like the album Redeemer of Souls, I hate to say it, but everyone's favorite cookie cutter producer, Andy Sneap, is on here. <laughs> he never changes a knob. Nope. Everything stays the same. <laughs> Uh, it was co-produced by a guy named Tom Alum or Alum, who actually uh, produced Ram It Down back in the day. But him and Andy Sneap came in. This reached number five in the UK, which was the first to hit the top ten since British Steel. Halford has gone on record as saying, I mean, a lot of a lot of singers will say the last thing they did is the greatest. But he says he really stands by. He thinks this is some of their strongest work. And also around this time, we start to find out that Parkinson's disease has really taken a bad grip on Glenn Tipton. So his ability to perform in the studio and perform live is starting to take a hit. And Andy Sneap is starting to fill in more and more as far as just some of these rhythm tracks um, and providing rhythm guitars, even live in concert. So once again, this is my number seven album. I think this is incredibly strong. And if the new album's anything like this, and we keep on this trajectory path, then we have something really excellent to look forward to when it's released. I had this at number six. This album is almost fucking flawless. Like, I honestly can't think of a song that I didn't like on here. It's just, you know, there were five other albums in front of it that I liked pretty much every song. Uh, this is the best album they have put out since Painkiller. There's no argument there. And if there is, I'm going to silence it really quickly. These songs are anthemic. They're also a little bit shorter. Like, a lot of these songs feel like they cut off whatever fucking fat was on there and hone them to just, just perfection. Like, you have excellent riffs on every song. Dude, Spectre, Never the Heroes. God, that song is fucking epic. Like, these are songs to just, like, get fucking pumped to. Dude, the title track is like a thrashy fucking barn burner. Like, it comes out swinging. Children of the Sun has great doomy riffs. Like, everything about this is awesome. And as much as I dog on Andy Sneap's production because it never changes from album to album, it really works here. It gives them kind of a shot in the arm they needed because, well, I like the production of the last one. It was a little bit gritty. You know, it wasn't as fine-tuned. Like, this just sounds awesome. Like, mm. sonically, it's fucking perfect. Rob Halford is belting out just incredible fucking notes still. Uh, yeah, this, this album's just disgusting. The only thing I can knock it on is maybe Evil Never Dies because uh, beware, there's voodoo in the night. I keep hearing doo-doo. <laughs> Beware, know. there is duty. There is duty in the night. Like, you step in shit in the middle of the night, you're gonna be a little pissed, yeah, all right? I mean, yeah. watch out. For all the reasons everybody just said this record is awesome and flawless, this is my number three. Rob Halford sounds better than I think he sounded in, in years. Like, for the first time, he sounds more like himself again. 
uh, really solid transitions, rad leads, non-stop riffs. Yeah, even though Evil Never Dies sounds like too much doo-doo, that's still a... You gotta a, wear the doo-doo in the night. Yep, yeah, wear the doo-doo in the night. Uh, that's a pretty awesome song. Children of the Sun, mm. darker, more mid-tempo. Like, there's a lot of mid-tempo grooves on here. So you got a great mix between thrashy and, and fast and jamming to more mid-tempo and heavy. Like, it's just a, a culmination of everything they've had up until now. And I think it's, uh, it makes me want to start a groovy thrash band. But yeah, uh, it's my number three. I thought it, it's a great, you know, last record as far as now to go out on. And uh, I had a good time with it. And uh, yeah, number three. Now we've gone through all of 18 Judas Priest albums. They are currently working on number 19. They just released a single called Panic Attack, which I think was a really cool Cool track. I um, dig it. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty hyped for it. It sounds like, from what I've been reading, that there will be some kind of like almost progressive rock elements in this, so maybe a little bit more, some nods to maybe some 70s stuff. We will see. So far, the first track off it has been promising, but, you know, we've been fooled by promising tracks from <laughs> bands before, so we can't really say until, until we hear it. However... We've been fooled by this band. Yeah, yes, we have been so fooled by this most band. Most notably by this band. <laughs> but yeah, that basically brings us to the end. Judas Priest is a classic heavy metal band. They deserve their place in the Mount Rushmore of classic heavy metal. And they will probably continue to do this until one of these guys just drops dead. Probably, yeah. yeah. Pretty much metal gods. I mean, they, they summed it up uh, earlier on in their career. Uh, yeah, unfortunately we weren't able to get Miller on this one, uh, you know, conflicting schedules, but we wanted to get this one done, so the next ranking, which will be Black Dahlia Murder, and that'll yep. be helmed by Jam and John, will definitely feature more people for sure. Yep. But, uh, yeah, we, we wanted to get this one done because this is such an important band, and I've been, like, really stoked to go over them, even though I trashed some of their albums. Yeah, me personally, I became a giant Judas Priest fan, which I realize I probably should have been a long time ago, but, you know... The as the, the cards fall, you get into things at different times in life. And, um, you know, this ranking has definitely made me a fan. I'm really happy with that. Yeah, got the Black Diamond Murder ranking coming up here soon. Super, super stoked for that. I know a lot of people are, too. That'll be a definite fun one to go over. Um, tons of content coming your way as always. We've always got stuff to do all the time here in Thralls of Metal. So as always, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all the time. We are also on Patreon. If you would like to help us out there, there's a link down below to ThrallsMetal.com. Our Patreon link is there. It is also on our channel, but ThrallsMetal.com is where you go to get Thralls Metal stuff. We have new shirts. We have old shirts. We even have hats now. So if you're looking for any of that stuff, that is exactly where to find it. And last but not least, thank you to each and every one of you who keeps showing up and liking and commenting and, and watching. Watching. Yeah. Yep. We couldn't do this without you guys. Thralls of Metal has become a, a living, breathing entity. It's because of all you that are helping us out along the way. It's become a, a family. We really fucking enjoy this. We get tons more to go. But for now, we will catch you later. <laughs>